I have a question, Unity on the Bay, each and every one of you. I ask, I never ask a question of you that I'm not willing to ask of myself. Here's the question. Are you addicted? Are you addicted right now in this moment? I'm here to tell you I am. You know, I went to the dictionary to find out exactly what this word means, dic uh, addiction, and, and here's what I came up with. There are several different ones, but the one I thought that was most appropriate for my comments this morning is this. Addiction is a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. A strong inclination to do, to use, or indulge in something repeatedly. Now, I will say, thank you, God, my addictions have, uh, have improved or refined themselves over the years. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today as I share my comments with you. But they've improved, but I still have them. You know, another word for addictions, my friends, is attachments, things that we sort of trace our identity to, things that we adopt as part of who we are. Thus, we repeat them over and over and over again. Before I go any further this morning, I want you to look down at the comments section because we're providing a wonderful opportunity for you or anyone you know and love that may be working through a situation with addiction right now to receive a free copy of a wonderful booklet from our Unity World headquarters in Missouri. It's called The Spiritual Journey from Addiction to Recovery. Now, it's a reality that every aspect of our life experience is a journey, a spiritual journey. The one from addiction, the one from attachment, the one from investing in something, especially anything that may not be serving us or is not good or healthy for us, that experience of moving from addiction to recovery is or can be certainly a powerful spiritual experience. So I encourage you to take advantage and check that link and, and get a hold of a copy of this wonderful book that we are making available to you today. You know, we've been under a lot of pressure, all of us, for a number of months now. We've had the pandemic, we've had economic despair, we've had a sense of divisiveness sweeping across our country and in fact seems to be always present around the world. Our addictive behaviors right now very well might be, my friends, our go-to behaviors because it's in times of pressure and stress and tension that we go to, whether it's good for us or not, what perhaps just seems most available to us, most comforting to us. So I understand that. I, I want to talk a little bit this morning, um, and I'm taking these words from the story of the prodigal son in the book of Luke. A little bit about loose living. <laughs> Are you a loose liver? I know I have been a loose liver of life during the course of my presence on this planet. There are, you know, certain ways, uh, certain addictions that are obvious to us, and some of us have dealt with them or may be dealing with them right now. It's drinking, it's drugging, it's eating, it's, it's sex, it's shopping, it's smoking, it's gambling, it's... Uh, romance. A lot of people can experience addiction to romance. And some of these addictions are not so obvious to us. How many of us might find ourselves, at least from time to time, addicted to gossip or addicted to demonizing other people or demonizing ourselves, even worse yet? How many of us might be experiencing an addiction to productivity? I still suffer from that one occasionally, aka workaholism. And how many of us might have a little bit of uh, an addiction to judging things, analyzing things, evaluating things, and believing our opinions to be better than others? How many of us might have some level of addiction with the material world and wanting to get our hands on more things? <laughs> I'm thinking of somebody in particular, but I won't share their name. Well, Faye, I'm sort of remembering you and your shoe collection. This doesn't have to be a bad thing, you know? It's just to be aware of the things that we maybe do enjoy bringing more of into our lives and the things that perhaps we don't enjoy, but we draw them in anyway. Some people are addicted, you know, to spirituality. They can't wait to go to the next workshop, and they can't wait to read the next book, and, and they're still looking outside of themselves, you see, which is what this addiction or addictive behavior is all about. And there's nobody in the room today, and there's nobody on the planet that isn't dealing to some degree with an addiction to a belief system. We get addicted. Remember, these are ideas, these are thoughts that we keep repeating. So they become addictive. They become things that we are deeply attached to. And we'll let go of a lot of things in this life, but boy, that belief system, the things that we treasure and believe to be true, we're not so willing to let those go. This isn't good. This isn't bad. 
It's just recognizing it's a strong inclination to do, to use, or to indulge in something repeatedly. And there's nobody on the planet that isn't doing that right now. I want to share with you a little bit about a story that's found in the book of Luke. And it's familiar to many of you, I presume. It's one of my, well, I'll say this, it is my favorite story in scripture. It's in Luke, the 15th chapter, starts at the 11th verse. And this is the story of the prodigal son, where if you remember, the younger of two sons said to his father, I want my half of the estate. And the father gave him that half of the estate, and the younger son went off and and, uh, lived a life of loose living. He got involved in all kinds of things. He spent all the inheritance that his father had given him until he got to a place where he was, as he said, would have been happy to eat the, the little bit that was being fed to the pigs. And finally, he came to himself one day, Scripture tells us. And in that day in which he came to himself, he decided to go back to return to his father's house. And who knew what he would meet there, save an unconditionally loving father who embraced him, kissed him, and had a huge celebration in honor of the son's return. Now, the place that the son went to where he experienced loose living was called the Far Country. And I believe the far country metaphysically represents an attempt to fulfill ourselves through our five senses. And now we're broadening this understanding of addiction and attachment even farther by saying if we're seeking fulfillment in any way through the experience of our five senses, we have something to work on. Again, we're not putting judgment on this. We're just having something to work on. And I constantly have something to work on, some deeper level where I realize I am relating to myself as merely an individual linked to its five senses without recognizing there are deeper dimensions worthy of my exploration that are in my midst. Personally, I had my own journey. I've had several journeys into the far country. And uh, one of them was when I was rather young, and I've shared pieces and parts of this with you before, but never really the whole story. Most of you know that I was raised in the unity movement. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that. There was a lot of stuff that I didn't have to unlearn because of having this um, familiarity and this integration with the unity way of life. And yet at the same time, while I was in Sunday school on Sunday mornings and later participating in youth programs, when I would return home and understand I loved both of my parents dearly, I loved my whole family, loved my sister dearly. But I lived in a bipolar home. And if anybody has ever lived in a bipolar home, you know that the keynotes of this environment, when you have a father and a sister who are bipolar, are total unpredictability. And typically, a lot of chaos ensues. So I had that challenge. Um, It was actually crazy. Uh, There were times when I was living in a totally crazy environment, and I didn't realize there was any environment outside of that. So as a child and as a young man, I never wanted to rock the boat. The waters were turbulent enough, God knows. I wanted to be always the good boy. I wanted to be the one who shined until... My 18th birthday. Now, you have to understand that when I got into high school desperately seeking some clan, some group, some, um, some individuals that I could identify with and, and bond with, I got into what we then called the theater freaks. And these were great people. They were very authentic. They were very original. They challenged the thinking of their times. I loved it. But I remember on my 18th birthday, my best friend came to pick me up out in front of my parents' home. And I got into the car, and he looked at me, and he said, "Uh, happy birthday, and he held out his hand, and in the middle of his palm was this strange-looking hand-rolled cigarette. And I came to find out within just a few moments that all of these theater freak friends that I had been associating with had been partaking of marijuana for some time. I had just never been one of them, and apparently they decided that on my 18th birthday, it was time for me to step up to the plate. So I did, and I actually enjoyed the experience and um, went on into um, my college years, and in addition to wanting to have a good time, I had a very exploratory spirit. So I did back then, we called it speed. I think it was some varied form of what we'd now call cocaine or definitely an upper. We had 
quaaludes, we had LSD, we had alcohol. There was a constant environment of partying and carefree living that finally culminated in a space where I realized none of this seeking in the outer was going to fulfill me. It promised every single time, but it never delivered. Those were my years of loose living. Through it all, I knew that I wanted something more. I wanted something more. However, in the midst of what I had dealt with, it turned from good times into very challenging times. I ended up dropping out of college. I returned to my mom and dad's house. And in a state of desperation, pretty much, my mother came home from church. She had attended a service at Unity Village Chapel at our world headquarters in Missouri. And she told me that there was a job opportunity available there. And I was kind of trying to clean up my act. I was a good kid, really, at heart. I was beginning to understand that. And my trip into the um, far country was starting to find me returning home as I applied for this job at Unity Village as a part-time tour guide that summer. And it turned out to be a life-changing activity. I want you to know something. I would not trade any of those experiences for anything. I often say that years later, I entered seminary to learn the technicalities of being a minister. But where I had the experiences that have empowered me to be the minister that I am today, those were those experiences that I had when I was off in the far country. And I've been in the far country a few times since then in different sorts of ways. Never a comfortable place to be, but always a place that is rich and filled with opportunity and learning experiences that enrich us and empower us to be able to do that which we are on this planet to do. Now, if you haven't noticed, it's a crazy, unpredictable world right now. But I'm here to tell you that it was a crazy, unpredictable world in 1972 during my far country experience. I was searching. I was really searching in my heart from some form of sanity and relief from what I was experiencing around me in my early years. We all are, my friends. There's not a one of us that isn't seeking relief in each and every moment because we see through the perceptions of our five senses the craziness that's going on and the insanity, and we want some form of relief. A number of years ago, I was saddened, but I was also privileged to officiate a memorial service for a young lady, a very young lady, and I was talking with her mother. Um, she said, well, you know, um, Heidi had passed away from a heroin overdose, and she said the worst part of it is that she was such a beautiful and spiritual person and no one knew it and no one probably even believes it now because of the method and the means of her demise people had been judging her harshly and people had been uh, finding no no reason to support her with faith she had really been neglected by most except for her mother and she said but she was uh, beautifully heidi was a beautiful beautifully sensitive a spiritual soul and I said I totally get that you know for her when you're spiritually sensitive when you're emotionally sensitive this world becomes an even more challenging place it can easily become intolerable when you look at the way in which people the oftentimes brutal and senseless ways that people behave with one another she wanted relief and we're all looking for the same relief so I want you to hear me this morning when I say to you if you are in the throes of any kind of an addiction that is not serving you right now I get it and there's not an ounce of judgment in me I'm not promoting any guilt or shame or expecting you to accept any such emotions or states of mind. I actually believe that it's pretty amazing, if not miraculous, that we've all made it this far as relatively unscathed as we have. It's a sign of your emotional sensitivity and your inability to cope with insane behavior. Anyone can understand that. You cannot, however, relieve insanity with insanity. You can't try to get over your insanity or to reduce the insanity that's plaking, taking place around you through insane means. You have to look elsewhere. You have to look elsewhere. You have to, like the prodigal son, come home. Many of us are familiar with the phenomenal works that have been accomplished through Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I mean, untold numbers of individuals have been helped and healed through the powerful 12-step program. And I'm not going to go through all 12 of those steps today, but I'm going to touch on three of them that I think are especially important when we're speaking about your journey homeward bound from the far country, from loose living, if you will. And I'm going to begin not with the first step, but with the second step. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I love the word sanity because I do think we're in the midst of insane conditions, just being alive on the planet. So we have to begin to realize that there's something greater than the insanity that we have familiarized ourselves with, even if it's gotten to some degree comfortable for us, and recognize that there's got to be something greater, something grander, a higher power that can restore us to sanity. And we've got to stop looking to insanity to try to become insane. It's a different mindset and it's a different set of behaviors. And then the third step of the 12 steps in Alcoholic Anonymous made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And of course, in unity, we would say, as we understood God, as we understood him, her. Make a decision to turn our will over. In other words, I'm not going to try to provide the remedies for my own inescapable or seemingly inescapable situation or circumstance here. I'm going to trust that this same higher power that I'm choosing to believe in has the ability to rescue me, if you will, to save me from this insanity and the behaviors that have accompanied that state of being. And then I'm skipping all the way to the 11th step sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So these three steps, hugely important. They're all wonderful steps in the 12-step program, but these three indicate the importance of recognizing that there is something higher that we, and I don't care what you call this, call it God, call it infinite intelligence, call it innate creativity, call it spirit, call it the universe. There are countless names for it, but it's about believing that there's something greater than that which you currently can comprehend and deciding you're going to trust. It's a bold move. That's why so many of us had to go really, really low before we would finally be audacious enough to reach high and to proclaim this power as being available to us. So you have to recognize it first, and then you have to make a decision so it gets even more challenging at this point. You're going to give your life over. You're going to give your personal will over to a higher will that knows your own best interests better than you do. So this is not for the faint-hearted, but so many brave, bold individuals have been able to step into these awarenesses, and you can too, anyone can. And remember, this just doesn't have to do with the obvious addictions. It has to do with any addiction, any attachment that you may be working through that is not presently serving you or that is in any way harming you. And then you have to say, I'm going to not only believe in this and hand my life over to it, I'm going to make a commitment to developing a relationship with it, an ongoing relationship. And the way that we do this is not through the five senses, as we would typically in any other relationship. It is through recognizing prayer and meditation as the keynotes, that is, the quieting of the world and the restless mind, and coming into focus with that which dwells in the center of our being and saying, I've wanted a lot of experiences in my life. Some of them I wanted just for good times and fun, and sometimes I wanted them for escape. Sometimes I wanted them to try to grab hold of some level of insanity to relieve me of all this madness that is going on around me. But my friends, we have to want the experience of God more than anything else. And I personally believe that whatever it takes for us to get to that place is worth it. Abraham Hicks says this, there is so much power in your wanting than you understand. You can release what you are not wanting by putting your thought on what you are wanting instead. Remember that thought can be compulsive. It can be obsessive. So if you're obsessing about something that you 
don't want, you're going to be producing, or you're, or you're constantly preoccupied with it, your mind, your focus, your attention is going to be on that, and by virtue of the law of attraction, it's going to increase, while at the same time, you can change your mind, decide that you want something else, and start to put your focus on that. You can, one could say, become addicted to the experience of God. And what does that mean? It means to become addicted to the experience of peace, addicted to the experience of love, addicted to the experience of joy, the experiences of wholeness, support, supply, unity. And these, my friends, I guarantee you, not only promise, but they always deliver. Unlike those seeming remedies that exist outside of us, the ones that the Spirit of God has planted inside of you will deliver. They will be good on their promises and they will provide that which you need at any given moment in time. They always work, and I might add, the high is really exceptional. Gandhi once said, only give up a thing when you want some other condition so much that the thing no longer has any attraction for you. In other words, we have to find something else to fix our attention on to put our focus on something else, to begin to want something so much that that which we were seeking to release no longer has any appeal, no longer has any attraction. So we must want our next hit, our next shot, our next rush, our next toke to be of God, to be of peace, to be of love, to be of joy, wholeness, service, supply, unity. More than anything else in this universe, we've got to want those experiences. We've got to search them out. Dear God, when I remember back in those days how I would search high and low for the next fix of any kind of drug that I could find, I was willing to do anything. I was willing to even put my life at risk in certain occasions. Now I can tell you this. I would feel that way only about a deep and more enriching experience of the presence of God. I know what it's like, my friends, to crave a drug, to crave a high, to, to find an escape, to seek temporary relief from the sanity in this world. I have been there. I understand it. And now I can tell you it is possible to decide what you want in a different kind of way, to decide what you want is the deep and lasting fulfillment of your heart and soul more than anything else that you have been looking to other means and methods that could not deliver. Now there is one that will deliver. And you've got to crave, have the craving to experience the presence of God in everybody and everything. Want that with all of your heart and you will find that those things that no longer serve you that once fulfilled your desires will of their own accord begin to slip and slide away as you become obsessed with nothing less than a direct contact with the presence of God within you and the ability to grow and cultivate that relationship every day of your life in ways that allow you to experience God's presence and power as unmistakable. And that, dear God, is the rush of a lifetime. God bless you.